and that's about it. Okay. Hello, hello. Hi, hi. Oh, what's going on with my sound? Might have my. I think I got my sound chosen for headphones because I was trying to. There we go. Hello, hello. Hey, Dan. Did hey. you see the weather forecast for next week? 50%. It's not too bad. It's not too bad. 36 degrees. Oh, God. I won't be coming. I can't walk off in that heat. Now, why is there an echo happening? There's kind of an echo happening. That's because we all have our very busy <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you know, you can. There might be parking clause. You never, you never know. Bill said there was some parking around his house. Yeah. How's this? Is this okay? Okay. Why is there such an echo? This is weird. Okay, hold on. Here. Oh, I wonder. Hello. Well, there's no echo now. Oh, if sometimes if it oh, comes okay. through your computer audio, right, you might right. be doing that. Okay, that's better. Anyway, you could try to get a spot close to the house there, Deb. I, I'm going to get there early. I could scout it out for you if you want. It's okay. It'll be the evening, but we'll see what will happen. Yeah, I'm going to uh, be there all day. Like, like, we're going to park, so maybe you could just take my spot. I'll move my cart somewhere temporarily. But We'll see. I'll figure it out. And, and we'll see about the weather, too. We still have a couple of days to see what the weather's going to do. But anyway. I tell you, Dan, I don't know any other person that would do what you do for us. I mean it. Like, I really don't, you know, it's not like you're making tons of money off of us. <laughs> well, I know, that. but it's going to be so cool. We're just talking about the Celtic Orchestra uh, is making a uh, recording next week on Wednesday. Uh, eight people at a time, four groups, uh, and my brother Marty's coming to conduct us. And uh, we're going to do eight people at a time and then stitch them all together to, into one big uh, video. And it's going to be pretty cool and fun. Uh, and uh, but you know there's we're doing it outside one of the one of the orchestra members has a huge driveway that uh, can fit eight people distanced uh, <clears throat> and uh, so we're gonna do that but uh, yeah it's a you know the weather of course is a factor for sure and uh, got, there's parking issues so there might be a bit of, a little bit of a trek for some people but I still have got four almost full groups of people coming to do this recording I'm looking forward to it so much because I haven't actually met everybody. There was only, I came to one rehearsal before I took over as music director and just sat in the back and checked it out. Barely said hi to anybody, really. And then ever since then, it's just been on Zoom. So it's, I'm really looking forward to it. So, so Dan, if it's 36 degrees out, which means the humidity is high, what's that going to mean to our violins? We just tune up to it. Well, it, it acclimatizes. High humidity is actually not the problem with violins. It's the okay. it's the drastic changes that are that are uh, the problem. So, like for instance, uh, uh, you know the joints on a violin. So when it's humid, the joints actually everything swells together really nicely. It's when it dries out afterwards really drastically. That you have problems so that's why it's way more dangerous in the winter with a violin than it is in the summer in the summer it's just that you have to give your fiddle a second to acclimatize to the humidity because the whole thing gets bigger that's what happens with the violin with humidity see there was a guy that did a youtube video one time i don't i wonder if it's still there of a violin <clears throat> and it's on a piece of white paper and he put the violin there and he put a black mark here i better record this stuff yeah so he put a black mark this on the. Is being recorded. <laughs> he put a black mark on the one piece of paper there, uh, on the one side of the violin, and then another marker uh, line on the other side of the violin, and then he humidified the room overnight quite a lot, quite heavily. The next morning he came and 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 took the measurements again, and the violin had surpassed the black mark a little bit. The whole thing gets a little bit bigger. And so that's why the fiddle sh sharpens up when it gets humid because it's tugging on the strings and tightening them more 
than, uh, than they usually would be. And so all you got to do in that case is just give your fiddle a few minutes to fill up with water <laughs> and then you tune it and it should pretty well stay there. It's when it changes a lot that it's the problem. See, the other thing I'm going to warn people about when we're playing in high humidity, and this is for anybody that goes to say an outdoor music camp, hey Pearl, or something like that, you know, next to a lake. So you, you take your bow out because your bow reacts to the humidity quite a lot as well. Actually, even more than the fiddle because you got to remember a bow is just a thin little stick of wood with hardly any varnish on it. And if you've ever looked at wood under a microscope, you'll see that it looks like a collection of straws. You know that box of straws next to the cash register? That's what it looks like. So the water rushes into those straws, the whole thing gets bigger, and that's why people find that they take their bow out of the case, say around a campfire or next to a lake, and they're playing away, and then after a few minutes it feels weird, and you look down and the thing is tightened on you, okay? And it can tighten on you quite a lot. And in some cases, like I remember my brother went to Tanglewood in Maine, it's a classical music camp, and he said that everybody had problems getting their bow to the right tightness because of the humidity. Those people are very picky, of course, uh, but I like to point it out because it's the extreme example. But So that's what you have to deal with with humidity. The, the humidity is not the danger, it's the, the change that's the danger. So, you know, when you get home from those situations, you leave your fiddle in the case. When you get it in the house, leave it in the case for a little while. Let everything dry out in a in a kind of slow way and the biggest danger is in the winter you know the electric heat can dry out your fiddle just like that and dangerous you know stuff like that yes pearl you can get like tiny little humidifiers oh yeah and i have one yeah. it was like two bucks but i've had it for a few <laughs> years and it works so. oh they're really good yeah no i've seen those and i've seen of course you see the snakes eh the humidity snakes now, the thing is, is that you only really need those things if you have a fiddle that's very old. So, like, for instance, my dad's fiddle, I kept a snake in it if I, when I was play, taking it out and playing it in bars. I kept a snake in it, a humidity snake in it, because it's a little over 100 years old. It's had lots of cracks. That's the other thing. Anytime a fiddle has cracked in the past, that's a place where water can rush in and out from this day forward because you can't really fix cracks on the top of the fiddle you can only shove glue in there and hope that it comes together so so it's it's been split many times you can see because he stored it in the attic for 20 years see that and so it's very susceptible so i keep a snake in there okay uh but my german fiddle this thing 1950 1963 not that old very well made very well fitted i never have to worry about it at all see what i mean but I know people that have 300 year old fiddles and they have all kinds of things. They use snakes. They use the thing in your case like Pearl was talking about. They're very, very particular because those old pieces of wood, there's no water left. They're completely dried out. And so when they dry out, they really hit rock bottom of moisture. Whereas this 1963, it's probably got another 50 years before it reaches the bottom. See what I mean? Yeah, Pearl. So mine's like 285. Would a humidity snake maybe, you know, be a good investment? <laughs> you have a 285 year old fiddle? Yeah, it's the same one I always play. Um, I got it from my grandmother's babysitter's grandmother. Wow. She gave it to her and then she didn't know anyone who played the violin so she gave it to me. And how do you know it's that old? Uh, you can kind of see the, the date inside. I well, have the same thing. I have an 1842 violin. Now you got to be careful about those dates on the inside of the violin because they don't always mean how old the violin is. If you see dates on a violin, on, like if you look in there, first of all, is it on a piece of paper? Like a label? Mine was in a book. Mine was at, it's listed in a book. So that's a good date for a production date. You see what I mean? But when you see those stickers on the inside and it says, you know, Stradivarius 1785, that's yeah. actually the design date, okay? Because yeah. Stradivarius refined his design over the many years that he made violins. So that's the Stradivarius design of 1794 or whatever. But it might have been made, say, in the 50s or the 60s. See what I mean? 
So mine was made by an American, so it's very odd, but it was made by an American and it's registered in that violin registry. Sure, thing. yeah. The, whenever I'm wondering about a fiddle, I just go see Mr. Andreas at Heinel. He knows every fiddle ever made. You open the case, he's like, oh, I know all about that fiddle. He's an amazing guy. but he. So I find it hard to get the age. You really have to know the progeny. The sticker doesn't always tell the story. It usually, and it's easy to confuse it. My brother Sean's heart fell. He thought his fiddle was from 1790 or whatever, went to Heinel. Andreas told him, no, that's just the design date. The, the fiddle is actually a German factory from about, say, the 60s or something like that, worth about two grand. Sean's heart fell. I'll never forget the look on his face. He thought it was a 300-year-old fiddle. Uh, and then, But then he said, you know, I love this fiddle. I did my degree on this fiddle. I love it. And, and Andreas was like, well, then it's the most valuable fiddle in the world. <laughs> so anyway, what are you finding out there, Pearl? Mine's like printed onto the wood. So that's a good indication. That might be a, an old fiddle. See? Let me see the back of it. Hold the back right up to the camera for me. hard to see hard to tell but I'll tell you what you should definitely bring it down to Heinel and tell him to give you the story on it it'd be really cool imagine what the story is hey eh? be really really neat sometimes the stories on these fiddles and the makers are just so cool it's like I love that anyway so how's everybody's fiddling going these days is it going okay not good Deb what's wrong with your fiddle and I you're too busy to play the fiddle I think oh in three days I've had 28 hours on the computer oh. just working on papers and projects oh. i'm tired i'm really tired <laughs> well we're gonna take it easy tonight we got we learned that new set of pocus there last week i thought that was pretty good and uh, so we'll work on that a little bit and i thought we could play a little bit of O'Carolyn's draft to be very very nice to end off uh, and maybe we'll work on our reels so I thought maybe we could start off by working on the reels, just nice and easy. We'll get a nice reggae groove going since it's uh, summertime, you know. I was saying to the orchestra last night, because we're playing reels at 60 beats a minute for the orchestra, hey? Eh? Which is, you know, it's not really, really slow. Like everybody was enjoying the groove and so was I. And I mentioned how reggae music, Bob Marley music and, and the stuff that came before was all recorded at 60 beats a minute. And the reason that is, is because it's most people's resting heart rate. And so it's represent, that tempo is representative of your body at rest. Very relaxing, very kind of zen type of uh, thing. So I thought maybe we could do the reels, see how we're doing with them, see if we can play them in around 60 and get that nice gentle groove going. And it gives you a chance to may you know play things in tune and and get a nice sound out of your fiddle and i think it'd be really nice okay but first yeah oh yeah can i just ask a question yeah um is this thursday night group going to keep going through the summer or what is the plan there yes it is i'm going to just okay. do it all summer yeah i decided to make a, a challenge of it because we are going to travel but really, there's no reason why I can't uh, keep doing it, even if we're in, say, a hotel or somebody's place. So I'm going to make it my mission all summer to keep my classes going. I think it'll be fun. <laughs> yeah, and I'm going to do, like, videos from the different places that we're traveling at, too. It'll be really fun. Yes, Pearl? I'm going up north next week. Yeah, you told so me, but it's okay. Have, you just look at all, everything will be on YouTube, Okay. So you just like, you, yeah, you can just go ahead and learn the stuff on YouTube at your leisure. And then when you get back to town in the fall, we can, you can just join up as if you never left. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll keep going with the YouTube thing too, for sure. No reason why not. Okay. So I think since we're going to work on our reels, which is the, uh, what do you call it there? The wise maid and the maid behind the bar, right? Yeah. So uh, let's work on D major, first of all. Uh, we'll just go up and down a, a, an octave and a half, as it were. So we'll start on D, go all the way up to E, go all the way down, sorry, go all the way up to A, high A, and then go all the way down to A. Uh, we'll do it a couple of times, we'll do the arpeggio, and then we'll play our reels. And we'll see what tempo they're at and see how they're feeling, okay? I'm gonna turn my tuner on, keep everybody honest. Here we go. 
that feeling, everyone? Feeling pretty good? Let's do it again then, right away. <clears throat> A one, two, three, and. Now let's do our arpeggio. So that's going to start on the low A, and the next note's going to be the D. Okay, let's give that a go. Ready, and... Again, let's do that again one more time. Ready and For me, that was much better. <laughs> and when I say that, I felt like my bow was moving better that time. The first time I did it, I had a couple of tiny hitch hops with my bow, and I just hate that. It interrupts my sound, makes my intonation wobble a tiny bit, and that time was much better. Okay. Hey, Bev, I love that painting behind you, man. It's so cool. Like, it looks like, who is that anyway? <clears throat> um, that was... Uh... We called him Uncle Ernie because he was um, my my mother-in-law's uncle. Pa uncle Ernie painted him. Okay. He was painting in my in-laws' house over the fireplace, and and after after they passed away and they sold the house, we kind of uh, grabbed Uncle Ernie. <laughs> <laughs> I would too. It's totally cool. You don't see the painting like that in somebody's house very often. It's very nice. Oh, no, but he reminds me of the ones like you had in the Three Stooges where the eyes would be cut out and then somebody's behind it. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you should do that gag sometime. <laughs> okay, great. So that's D major. Excellent, excellent. Now, let's try our reels, shall we? So I'm going to play a little bit of the 60, show you guys how that tempo is, see what you think, okay? Let's see here. Oh, whoops. I, uh, all my electronics are acting weird. I had a power outage last uh, on Tuesday during my beginner my uh, beginner class, and uh, they kept going without me. <laughs> and then when I, when I came back on, but unfortunately, I made a whole bunch of videos right after, and didn't realize that <clears throat> when my computer reboots, it readjusts the audio signal going in up to the top. And so I went and looked at the videos I made, all completely overdriven, like way too much signal. So I have to, I have to make them all again. Anyway, okay. There we go. So there's 60. for everybody do you think it's doable first of all yeah I'd say it's doable for everybody yeah cool okay well let's try it we'll try them two times each um, the uh, is it the wise made first 
that we're doing? Great. Okay. So, yes, Pearl. We did Wise Maid, the Drunken Landlady, and then the Maid Behind the Bar, because it was supposed to be like, oh, there's this Wise Lady, then she gets drunk, but then she turns her life around by get, getting a bar that she runs herself. Okay. <laughs> That's a great story. I came up with that. That's awesome. Okay, well, so we're sticking the drunken landlady in there. I forgot all about that. That's a great tune. Okay, so here we go. Wise bait. <clears throat> we'll start this running. One, two, three, and...
was getting into it. How are people feeling at 60? Anything happened? Anything didn't happen? I knew the notes better. It'd be good, but the notes I knew, it's, it's a good speed. It's a good speed. Yeah, it's a, you know, it's a goal. Like it's, you know. I know the notes. Yeah, it might take a few whacks, but I think we'll get there. Anybody else want to impart their experience playing at 60? No? <laughs> All right. Now, everybody looked really good for the most part. You know, they looked pretty smooth. You know, they didn't, nobody seemed to have to really stop for any length of time. So I thought that was good. I wouldn't mind trying it all again now that we got the lay of the land, but we'll just take a little right arm or left arm break, whatever it is, the one that bothers you the most. For me, it's the left one, always. The right one never seems to bother me, but my brother Sean, he gets it in the right. He gets tendinitis in his right arm from playing, and he's actually had his arm in a sling a couple times there years ago. I had to take a couple of weeks off, but uh, for me, it's always this one, always the left hand just gets really sore it's not the usual right people don't sit around doing this for hours like it's not the doctor doesn't say you know what you should do you should sit around like this for hours it's really good for you <laughs> anyway so dan what is it that bothers you is, is it your carpus or is it the tendons in your fingers or it's the it's the ulnar and biased nerves and, uh, oh, okay. So what happened is, and this, this experience might help other people that are trying to get their grip, the, the hold right, but uh, when I was growing up, I used no shoulder rest. You know, my brother Sean never used, he still doesn't use one. He did his whole day, violin degree, no shoulder rest. And, but then I took a long time off of playing. And uh, when, I was, when I came back to it, I was about 25, and, and I would be playing with no shoulder rest, and it was fine for the first few years, but then when I was really playing fiddle all the time, no more drums, I found that I was getting numbness. That was the first thing that I had. Numbness, in, in, it seemed to vary, either these three fingers or these three fingers, like either or. Uh, and uh, it was getting pretty kind of alarming because I'd be busking at the St. Lawrence Market and after about an hour and a half, I could not feel a thing on this hand. Now, my fingers still worked. They kept coming down like they should, you know, but I couldn't feel anything. And it affected my intonation because I couldn't feel how hard I was pushing on the strings. Had no sensation of it at all. So it would kind of make my intonation a bit weird. And so I went to see a physiotherapist about it and he had me bring my fiddle in and I picked up the fiddle and he basically said that when I was playing, my shoulder was up in the air like this all the time. And he said, what happens is your shoulder blade comes against your spinal cord right where those two nerves come out of the spinal cord. And uh, truckers get it, they call it trucker's elbow. It's exactly the same thing from, from driving like this. And uh, so he suggested a shoulder rest so I started using one from that day forward, and I do these stretches. I do this one, it's really good. I do this one, and I do the carpal tunnel stretch, which is this one. And if I do all that, and I exercise, and I use my shoulder rest, then I don't have any problems with the left hand except for normal getting tired. But I'll tell you, if sometimes I used to forget my shoulder rest when I was using the Everest, and I would get to a gig, realize that I didn't have it, take one look at the fiddle and think, oh my God, this is going to be a hard night, you know, because it really does get right in there if I don't use the shoulder rest. So, so that's what happens to me. <laughs> and apparently it's common for violinists. I, I got a massage once from a masseuse that worked on a, a Lorena, Lorena McKinnett tour, six month tour with Lorena McKinnett being her band's masseuse. And uh, she said the fiddle player in that band had a lot of the same problems as I was talking about. And she worked on him every day for months. She worked on what she called the terrible twist, which is really, it really is terrible. <laughs> and that's really what causes the discomfort of playing the violin. Is that it's just not a natural thing. But anyway, there you go. Anybody else have problems like that? Like... With the left arm, does, do you get a little bit of numbness in there sometimes? Yeah. When, when I feel it coming on, right, there's a couple of things that I watch for. First of all, I watch for a grip in the fiddle, like this, right? I really try to be conscious of that. If I'm gripping it, then it's gonna come in. The other thing I watch for is, because 
even though I'm using the shoulder rest, if I'm not relaxed, if I'm tense, then that shoulder can still come up, even though I'm using the shoulder rest. And that can cause the same problem. So those are the things that I notice in the way that I keep it at bay. Alrighty, shall we try it again? Three reels, 60 beats a minute. Right on.
like it went a little better even, <clears throat> except that people are getting tired, for sure. The limbs get tired, for sure. Now, Pearl, you had to stop quite a few times. Are you having some discomfort there? No, my arm's just really, really sore, and it gets sore in my thumb, oh. like right here. Yes, the old uh, chicken drumstick muscle, eh? Yeah. yeah. Now, do you know how to work on that? How to get rid of that tension in that in that muscle there? Have you ever seen the carpal tunnel stretch? No. Oh, let me show you. It's wicked. It's awesome. So you put your hands against something like this, stretch those fingers back, and then you grab the thumb very gently and just haul it down like that. See that? Gently. And because the person that showed me how to do it said often and gently, not like kind of sustained stretch but that gets rid of the tension in the drumstick there what causes that dan it's it's gripping the fiddle it's and do you feel like you're gripping the fiddle a little bit there pearl yeah and people grip the fiddle though for two reasons and it's good to identify if this is one of your reasons first of all it's normal to grip the fiddle if you're just a bit tired you know it's like i do that's what happens to me i notice it in hour three of the dance when i'm playing it's like I start to grip the fiddle because I'm getting a bit tired, okay? So that's the first thing. The second thing though that can be corrected is if your fiddle feels like doing this when you hold it, you're going to constantly be gripping that fiddle up here. There's no way about it. You just do it because you know your fiddle's going to come down and you're trying to keep it up and it makes this tension in that muscle and it stays there. It was wicked. It's, you know, I remember it happening to me because I didn't use the shoulder rest and that's what kept happening, eh? And I even worked out, like this is shameful, I don't know what's wrong with me, but I even worked out this little move. If I was playing in the key of E minor, I'd get my E minor double stop down really solid there and go like this. <laughs> Not ideal. Not ideal. See? So you want to, if that's happening to you, if you find your grip in the neck of the fiddle, see if your fiddle wants to do this. And the way that I test it is very simple. You put the fiddle up there, you lean your head, does it fall at all? Even a bit. Yes. So I would, if I were you, Pearl, mess around with the angle. And when I talk about the angle, I mean this angle. See that? See if you can find where that space is that the fiddle wants to go in all the time. It's driving you nuts. I can see that. I, I had a problem with my neck before because I didn't use a, a shoulder rest for a while. And that's when they discovered I had this problem in my neck. So we actually had to find a spot and I have it taped off. That's a great idea. So that I always make sure I go back into the same groove because I, it has to be in a certain spot so I won't absolutely yes and i always like to point out all excuse me also that if you're trying to figure out your grip with your shoulder rest like if you got a new one or whatever uh spend some time with it it took me a good long while to figure this out so this is what i need check this out you see it's kind of angled down this way a little bit it's not up on the end of the fiddle when i first started using the shoulder rest i put it on like everybody else did on the very end of the fiddle straight across like that that's how my father used to use it but i did not find that it worked the fiddle kept falling down i kept picking it up doing my move you know it wasn't working out so i played with it i tried different shoulder rests but this is what i came up with that really works for me it's this little angle a little bit more of an angle there yeah that's it there See that? And then I got the height adjusted. It really works for me. You can see it's a, pretty, it's a bit high on this side. See, there's a bit of a gap there. It's quite a gap on Actually, that side. which kind is that one? Because I tried to get one that had a high, a high one as well. Yeah. Yours looks way higher. This, uh, yes, this is the new generation Kun. You know, Kun, K-H-U-N. Yeah, this is, a, this is a Kun, and this was the expense, like this was the $80 one. This because is, it can go higher. Right. And it's and, flexible. Yeah. But that one looks even better. Yeah, it's the newest generation. It came out like just a few years ago. I remember oh, my I friend uh, found it at Heinel and was like, it's the newest Kun. And I got to say that it is much, much better than the old Kun. And I'll show you the ways that it's better. You're right, Deborah. It is really 
nice and high on this side. Yeah. But not only that, it doesn't fall off. You know how the coin always falls off of the fiddle? Yeah. yeah. So this one doesn't because look at the drastic angle that the leg is set at. See that? So it's really, it really does not fall off the fiddle. The nice, the other nice thing about the new generation of Kun is how uh, adjustable it is according to the width of your fiddle. So the regular Kun has three holes, right? You have three options for the width of your fiddle. This one has like infinite, like there's a dozen, it's a little slider and it can, you can even like take it and like move the whole thing uh, to one side or another. See that? Very Are you adjustable. Sure it's not the same one as mine. Mine slides. You too. got the sliders too. No, no, you don't. You have three holes. Yes, and I can adjust that to move. So you have three way. options. Whereas this new one, it has these little slider things. I'll show you. It's really this slick. This is a Kuhn Bravo. Yeah, I, yeah. This is I, this is called Solo. Solo. So I want to look into that one. You see these little slider deals here. Solo. Okay. Oh yeah, yours is way more and look i'll show you how many i'll, I'll actually undo it because i can put so it back how to much it. was that one check that out see how many positions there are there oh so that must have been like 100 bucks no this was 40 bucks mine was like 80. oh god well yours looks a little fancy too uh but anyway so so that's fine i find that to be much better see if i get this back in yes i can oh. that's great and the other thing that I find to be the best thing about the new Kun is whatever stuff they're using is really nonstick compared to the old Kun that it didn't take long for the stuff on the old Kun to dry out and then it's slipperier than it was before. <laughs> already, mine's already breaking off. Yeah, see this stuff see here is like it really does not slide. It's like, so I'm pretty impressed with it. And the nice thing about it is it collapses and it fits in my case. Yeah. So I haven't oh, lost gosh. one. I haven't lost it. Like I usually, I used to lose my shoulder rest because I'd leave it at a gigs. It didn't fit in my case, but this one, I, I've i held on to it. So I do recommend it. It's really, really good. The only thing, the only one that I would recommend over the Kun is the Everest. Have you ever seen one of those? Is that the one that, is that, is that the one that comes in the colors? It does come in colors and it's solid I, state. I have mine's, one. It's pretty thick. Yeah, it's, my really, it's my, mine's upstairs, but it's really big and it's solid state. It's not. It doesn't collapse. It doesn't have legs. It's just this big block, and it goes on there. And I actually love it, but I only use it for when I'm at home because it does not fit in my case or anything. It's really big, and so uh, I just have it at home. But I love it because it sticks on there. It never moves, and it's huge. Like I could even make it higher if I needed to, you know. So anyway, so there you go. So how does that feel now, Pearl? Let's see you hold that thing now. Put her up there. Let's see if, if it flops. Much better. I saw a tiny flop there, just like maybe a half inch, but that's much better. So you can keep, you know, friggin' with it, as my father would say, until you get it really reliable, okay? And remember, here's the test. Don't, because it's easy to get confused when you're messing around with your grip. It's easy to kind of go down the wrong path for a while. But here's the test. Fiddle on the shoulder, lean your head, no movement at all. And also no effort from me. I'm totally relaxed right, right now. I could take a nap. Okay, see that? And if, so if you find you're friggin' with it, if you find you're kind of like this, then you got to keep, keep working at it until you get it so that all you got to do is... See that? That's the test. And I have to go. Okay. Have, and have fun camping. All right, well, we're going to a cottage. <laughs> yeah. We'll talk to you next week. Okay, okay. thanks a lot, Dave. Bye. Bye-bye. I, I got a new one that actually Whoa. the pressure out over your shoulder. Woo, I like that. It's called Performa. Performa, I love that. Yeah, and also a, a much taller uh, chin rest so that I can... I've had a real problem with my fiddle falling. And yeah. So, Look at that. That is really good. Better. Yeah. Well, there the you go. That, the guys that I got this from, it's called the Wave. Um, they they kept sending it back and adjusting it, so it was great. Hmm. Really? Wow. 
That's pretty cool. So I'll have to remember that, but uh, that looks really, really cool. I, You know, I hate to freak with it because I, what I got going really actually works. You know what I mean? But I see something like that. It's like, ooh, could be even more comfortable, less work. <laughs> anyway, okay, so that's our reels. Now, I wouldn't mind getting our reels faster. Let me show you what 70 is like, okay? We're not going to try it, but I'm just going to show you. I'm so tired. <laughs> I'm just going to show you, don't worry. Oh, sorry, I didn't know you could hear me. That's all right. That's 70. Okay? <laughs> Diane is chuckling. So, it's an eventual goal. It could be an attainable goal for some people, and for most of you, I'm sure. But think of it as an eventual goal, okay? We'll try, we'll try a little bit of it there next time. See how people are getting along. Talk about it. Talk about ways that we can conserve your, your motion, conserve your energy, so you can get more music with less work, okay? Now, let's take our two polkas that we learned last time. Some cheeriness. Bally Desmond polkas. We'll go nice and slow to start with, though. While you guys get them out, I'll just play a little bit so you can remind me. <laughs> practice that one. Let's take her nice and slow. All right, there's no dancers in front of us right now, so we don't have to sweat the tempo. Nice and slow. We'll just play the whole thing from end to end a good couple times. Ready, two, three, and... Anybody having any problems, questions, queries, concerns about Bally Desmond number one? No? Can we crank it up a little bit then? Yeah, right on. So maybe kind of like... Let's see what happens at that tempo, shall we? 
Oh, one, two, three, and... see a few butts moving around to that type of uh, tempo that's really really good now let's take a look at the second one we'll start it off the same way nice and easy and we'll crank that up a little bit too it's slightly more complicated and I'm also going to get the music up because I don't want to confuse anybody and I, I play a lot of versions of this tune so let's see Alrighty, here we go. Bally Desmond number two, nice and slow. Be lovely. Okay. One, two, three.
everybody's bow is just moving along very cheerfully there. Anybody having any problems with anything? Yes, Deb. Okay, so I've, I've had this question from you with you before. Yeah. When you get to the end of the song, the and it's I find it hard to go from the end of the song back to the, the beginning of the second part. Yes. I, yeah, I we talked. Missing, but something's wrong. We talked about it last time, and it's because of the verse. It's the best version I can find on the session.org, but the way that they have the pickup notes split up there is not ideal. Uh, but what we most people usually do is they finish with the two big A's. And they make that C sharp and D there, the, the two pickup notes, basically into 16th notes. Okay. See what I mean? So it sounds like this. Now, it really doesn't matter because you can do this on top of what's written there, sound totally fine. But this is the way it would sound. So. See that? Yeah. yeah. So just think, the best way to think about it is just think two A's. And the pickup notes are quicker. Okay? Yeah. All right. Good question, though. Anybody else got any bits or pieces they want to work out? Bally Desmond number two. How you doing there, Calida? You're a little quiet tonight. You haven't said anything. You might, School is almost over for these two high school people here. It must be very, very exciting and also sad, right? Yeah, it's a bit of both, but I'm very excited today was like my first day where i didn't have like a set schedule Ooh. and i'm quite disoriented um oh. but i'm doing good with the valley desmonds yeah. oh that's good <laughs> that's, that's really good glad to hear it okay yes it's a very confusing time i mean it's great to be done but it's so weird such a weird way to leave it hey eh? such a weird way to leave all that work and my kids are going through the same thing except my boy his, it's it's a little bit worse for him because he just got all this uh, dental work done today. He got these this spreader put in his mouth, this metal spreader that he has to have in there for the foreseeable, and then he's getting braces. So that sucked for him today. <laughs> no more popcorn or toffee or anything like that. He's got to just cut all that out now for the next foreseeable. And uh, that's all his favorite stuff, so uh, it's kind of a drag. But anyway, I got my braces as an adult, and the the orthodontic the orthodontist said that instead of taking Advil before you get them cranked, he said just do a little swish and swallow afterwards. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> get rid of the infection. It's important, right? <laughs> okay. Anyway, so high schoolers, you're gonna have to bear up with it here. Let's do her again. All right, a little bit faster this time. All right. I think I'm going to get this music up once more. Here we go. One, two, three. <laughs>
that looked really, really good. Bow's moving nice. Anybody having problems at that tempo or is this pretty hunky-dory? That's great. Excellent. So now we're going to try the whole set. All right. And because they're so short, let's do them three times each. I mean, that's the usual in Ireland anyway. I've been truncating things because of the internet to two times each uh, because of the, you know, the screen and everything like that. But since these are so short, we'll do them the proper three times each and get a good practice in anyway. Okay, so roll out whatever you got to roll out there and we'll give it a go. And we'll try it up at that tempo. I don't think there's any reason why we can't. Have a little drink of water here, and then we'll get going. All right. Picture it, the dance floor is full of Irish people who want to Kaylee. One, two, three, and... Thanks very I much. I just screen too many hours, so I I'm hear you. Suffering. 
So I will, uh, when are you returning and when are you leaving? Um, oh, I, oh yeah, that's right. I'm gone for the weekend. I meant to email you. Yeah. So I'm getting back on Sunday evening. So maybe we can do something beginning of next week. Yes, I should be fine on Monday. Okay. We'll email. Okay, great. Okay. Bye Thank everybody. You. Have a nice weekend. You too there, Deborah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. All right. So how did that go there, everybody? How did it feel? Is it good? Worked okay? That's great. Excellente. Very good. Now, let's take a little breather there. I'm going to run to the bathroom quick, and then we're going to do O'Garrelin's Draft. Okay? We're going to practice that one. It'll be really nice to play that one and refresh it. Okay? Just one sec. Okay. try shall we nice and easy we don't have to go that fast we'll go nice and easy because it's a tune that is kind of you don't have to go fast with it that's for sure okay we'll see how it's see how it's feeling for everybody oh carolyn's draft it's a great one one two three Sorry guys, sorry. I realized that this is not, I might not be doing exactly the same version. I'm just going to get that version up so it's not confusing. Of course. Okay, just one sec. Sorry, I'm going to find it. Okay, I'm ready. Try that again. One, two, three.
a nice all four string double quadruple stop there at the end lovely all right how's everybody feeling about O'Carolyn's draft is there any stumbling blocks anything that's stopping you up or making you put the brakes on with the bow nothing that's great why don't we get it a touch faster it doesn't go much faster but it can I've heard it done as fast as this <laughs> Don't go quite as fast as that but let's go a little faster try a couple more times okay get her nice and cheery in the key of G and then you know the double stops you can do any of the arpeggio notes see that those are all arpeggio notes in the key of G that's not that's a C and an E together but that is a D and a B together. See that? And I play this octave a lot in this tune. See that? The G and the G together is really strengthening. The other thing you can do with the low string there is to play the B with it. I love doing that. See that? B and G together. Okay? You can play around with those things while we're going here. The one Ocalada was doing is the... B on the A string, the G on the E string, and the open G and open D all together. See that? Very fancy. Very fancy indeed. Okay, so keep that in mind while we're playing along here. See if you can get a few of those in there. Be nice. Okay. Oh, one, two, three.
right about the uh, O'Carolan's draft? You trying any of those little double stops? I saw I hit a run of double stops and Pearl looked at me and was kind of like, <laughs> so hopefully you'll get a few of those in there, Pearl. There's, it's like, uh, see that? It's such a nice run. See that? That's all that on the D and the A string there. I copy what you're doing, and then I realized that once I started doing it, you stopped and I was like, oh, wait. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, there is a delay with the Zoom. So the other ones I was doing, I forgot to mention. I do a lot of that in this tune, eh? That's a fourth. So that's the D on the A string and the G on the E string. Give that a try, everybody. It's a hard one to tune because it's a fourth. If it's at a tune even a little bit, it sounds awful, okay? It has to be bang on. And I find my second finger sticks down really far, so I have to ease up on it. Otherwise, that G is sharp. See that? So anyway, it's a fun one. It's a beautiful one. So, uh, uh, yeah. Oh, see, you hear that? See, it's nice at the top. And then I do that one. Those, those are the ones that I do there, okay? So you can think about that. It's all on the video, on the YouTube video. You can think about it and see if you can get a few of those in there and we'll re-look at it next time. Now I'm thinking for next time we need a new tune. And we haven't done very much Scottish music and I feel like I'm neglecting the Scottish music a tiny bit, especially since I am Scottish and I got this shirt. So I feel like I really should do uh, something Scottish there. Uh, and I, I do have, it's not Scottish, it's Cape Breton, but it's a really, really great tune. It's called Trip to Mabu Ridge. Has anybody ever heard of that tune? No? Okay. You did, Pearl? I've heard the title before, but I don't think I've ever actually heard the tune itself. Oh, cool. Okay, so I'm going to show you what it sounds like here. I found it recently for a student. Here it is. What is with my computer these days? There it is, okay. So let me play it for you first off there, guys.
what do you guys think? You like it? Yeah, it's a good one, eh? Very, very good one. I love that tune. It's a meaty one, you know? And it's one of these classic Scottish tunes where, did you notice that there's the A part, then the B part, and then the C part and the D part sound a lot like the A part and the B part, right? Except more elaborate, more filled out with notes, you know, a little bit notier. And it's very typical of Scottish music. It's often like that. It's because of the bagpipes. The bagpipes only have nine notes available to them. That's all they can play is nine notes. This is the bagpipe scale. See that? It's an A major scale with a G natural, and it actually goes all the way down to G. That's the all they have to work with. So whenever you, find, you hear a pipe tune, the first two parts are usually the theme, the second, the response to the theme, and then more rhythmic ways to do it after that. And the last part of a Highland pipe tune is often the most syncopated of the whole tune because of that. It's their only option. Let me give you an example. This is a great tune, and we'll learn it at some point. It's called Troy's Wedding. It's a Highland pipe jig. Check this out. <laughs> syncopated that is now it's actually a fake syncopation I don't know if you noticed during that part but I did not play any notes that were not eighth notes there was no long and short notes to make the syncopation at all see that all the same length of note but the way that I'm going up the scale is the lower note, da dee dee, then I skip one, da dee, then two more, da dee dee, and then I skip two, da dee, da dee, da dee dee, da dee da. Just the arrangement of those notes in that order gives it the syncopated sound. They call that melodic syncopation. <laughs> Unlike, say, O oh Susanna, which is a rhythmic syncopation. Where the long note is in an odd place. Do you hear that? That's how they make that syncopation. It's different. So this is a melodic syncopation, and the Scottish music is completely full of it. Now tell me something. What would you rather learn next time? Troy's Wedding or Trip to Mabu Ridge? Which one? Who... Troy's wedding. Troy's wedding. Okay, yeah, it's a much, it's a way better tune. Yeah, and it's a happy one. And it occurs to me that we could also do the jig of slurs. Has anybody ever heard of the jig of slurs? You have, Susan. Another happy one. It really is. It's another Highland Pipe one. It's very popular. Everybody in the world plays the jig of slurs. All right. Whenever you go to a folk festival and they mash three different bands together to do some kind of finale, nine times out of ten they play the jig of slurs because everybody knows it. <laughs> okay? Now I know you're all looking it up there on your devices. Let me play it for you.
that my family used to do that before Troy's wedding it made quite a nice combination okay but so for next week we're gonna play Troy's wedding I will upload it to YouTube so you guys can get familiar with it because it is a three-parter so it's quite a bite to chew and it's got that crazy part okay so I'll get it up online so you guys can start familiarizing yourselves with it right away and we'll start in on it next time all right now before we go let's have one more little uh, crack at O'Carolyn's draft there to make sure it's sitting nicely on the old fiddle there and then any questions or anything like that and then we'll be done for uh, the month of June all right and we're gonna lose Pearl that's okay though uh, she's gonna keep up and uh, and yeah it'll be, it'll be really good so here we go well, Carolyn's draft one more crack nice and easy one two three <laughs> summer there Pearl up in the uh, up in the trailer there in the woods it sounds very nice and uh, for everybody else we're gonna see you next week and you look for those YouTube videos okay of uh, what do you call it Troy's wedding and I'll also put the Jigga slurs up there why not all right have a great week everybody happy Canada Day and all that kind of stuff <laughs> Bye. thank Bye -bye. you thank you